All right, so let's say the data you're working with had a task with two conditions, and you've gone ahead and analyzed the ERPs or the oscillatory power for all your participants, and now you want to know when were there differences between our two conditions. So you might have some prior knowledge where you say, let's say that at a certain set of frontal electrodes from 200 to 300 milliseconds, we should find an effect then you could just average across that set of electrodes in that time window for all your participants and then just use something like a t-test to decide whether or not the difference between conditions was significant or not and you'll get some p-value and say yes it was significant no there was no difference if you don't however have that prior knowledge as to where an effect should be both in space and in time then that approach doesn't work quite as well so if you tried to just for instance look at every single point in time and every single electrode and use a t-test and see whether or not there was a difference, then even if there were no true differences, you're going to find a lot of effects that had a p-value that was greater than some threshold. Because we're making so many comparisons, we want a method that accounts for the number of comparisons that we're using. Now, the simplest approach to this, to a control for these multiple comparisons, is to just use a more stringent p-value. So as we make more comparisons, we just lower the p-value. But because we might have something like a thousand time points and a hundred channels, that approach doesn't really work as well. If we tried to just have a p-value that was stringent enough to account for that number of comparisons, then we would never find any effects, right? We would make lots of type two errors. So we want an approach that balances that type one and type two error rate. So what we're gonna use is cluster-based permutation tests. And again, this is just essentially a way of answering at what time and at what electrodes was there a significant difference between our two conditions. So first I'm gonna describe the process that we use um, to first identify clusters and to um, use permutation testing to decide when clusters are significant. And then I'm gonna go through each step in a little more detail. So first, like I said, we want to know where the clusters are in our data. So a cluster is just a kind of effect where the activity uh, in a certain region and at a certain time period was greater or different in one condition compared to the other. So if you look at something like here in the top right, this might have been a cluster in space where we have electrodes that are neighbors of one another, which we've defined, and they tend to show activity that was significant. And this might also exist across time. So maybe at a certain set of electrodes for 100 milliseconds, they all showed a significant effect. We're gonna define that as a cluster. So first we wanna be able to identify the clusters and quantify their strength. So where were the clusters in time and space and how large were they? Once we've done that with our data, then we wanna know, okay, what size clusters are significant and what size clusters are insignificant? So we wanna know essentially, what is the probability that we would find a cluster of that size based on chance? So to answer that, then we're gonna use permutation testing. So this involves shuffling our data and identifying clusters in random sets of data. So rather than using condition one and condition two, we're going to combine them and then divide so that each kind of set has some of condition one and some of condition two. And we're going to see what size clusters we get when we do that random shuffling. So after that, we're going to use permutation. We're going to do that random shuffling maybe a thousand times. And we're going to see what distribution of cluster sizes we tend to get just based on chance. So if you can look at something like a histogram here, we might have the cluster sizes that we expect to get just when we do that shuffling process. From there, we can use that distribution to identify is our cluster significant or is it insignificant? And what's the probability that a cluster of that size might have appeared just based on chance? All right, so the first kind of step that we need to talk about is how we identify clusters. So first, what we wanna do is we want to look at every point in time and every point in space, just like we talked about originally, um, and quantify the effect between our two conditions. So for instance, we might wanna know at this time point, at this channel, uh, what was the difference across all of our participants from condition one to condition two? So we would just take the values of condition one and condition two for all our participants and use a t-test. And this would allow us to quantify the strength. We could use the t-value from a t-test comparing those conditions across participants. And this would be kind of a quantification of the effect at every channel time pair. And we would do that for every point in time and at every single channel. So we would just quantify what was the size of the difference between our two conditions at this point in time and at this point in space. So once we do that, what we're left with is 
like I just said, for every point in time and every point in space, a number that tells us how large the effect was, how big of a difference there was between our two conditions uh, at that point in time and that point in space. Now what we're going to do is use some test parameter, so maybe a p-value of 0.05, uh, which corresponds to a t-value of 1.35, let's say, just in this example, and we're going to take any um, effect that we just looked at that's significant based on that value, and we're going to use that to try and identify clusters in the data. So for instance, you can see here that all of these green circles were significant in that the effect at that point in time and that point in space was greater than some test parameter. So what you notice is that there's gonna be some uh, differences that are slightly erratic where they don't, maybe they occur at one point in time and then disappear or they occur at one point in space and disappear. And there's also going to be clusters that emerge where at across time and at different neighboring points in space, there was significant differences. And this is how we're gonna identify clusters. So we're just gonna use a, some parameters and we're gonna say, for instance, a cluster has to last longer than three samples or a cluster has to include a minimum of three channels or something like that. And that's gonna allow us to identify clusters in the data. So once we've done this, then we want to quantify the size of those clusters. So again, this is just a visualization of what a cluster might look like. It's neighboring points in space, electrodes that are neighbors with one another that all show a significant difference between conditions and that lasts across time. So at different time points. So in order to quantify the size of that cluster, what we're gonna do is sum up all of the T values in the cluster. So for instance, we would sum the T value recorded at this electrode and all these ones, as well as the ones in these, because they're part of the same cluster. And however long it was, however many time points, we would add up all of those. And that would give us one value. Let's say it was 50. And that would say, OK, how large was this cluster? So now we've done this for our two conditions. And we've identified one or a bunch of clusters, however many that there are. And each of them has their own size. What we want to do, like I said before now, is say what clusters of a certain size are significant and what clusters are insignificant. So what we're going to do is use permutation testing to get a distribution of cluster sizes that might occur by chance and then use that distribution to say when or when not a cluster that we found in our real data is significant. So again, we're going to randomly divide the data from both of our conditions into two sets. So that you know, random data set one, instead of corresponding to condition one, is now going to have a mix of condition one and condition two, similarly for random data set two. Um, and then we're going to use that as what we did beforehand when we did that cluster identification process. So rather now than using our conditions, we're going to use randomly shuffled data and apply the exact same process to see what size clusters we get. So for each channel time pair, we're going to take the T value. Uh, we're going to identify clusters from the T values at every time point and every channel. And we're going to see how large that cluster is. So we'll give it some value here. All right, so the final step is to just do that process a ton of times, let's say a thousand or 10,000 times, and then look at the distribution of all of those sizes. Um, so maybe, you know, like I said earlier, maybe this cluster statistic here, maybe clusters of a size 30, let's say, um, were quite common, whereas clusters of a size 40 were quite rare. And we can look at, OK, what percentile do we want to have as our significant threshold? And we can say, if our cluster that we found was larger than that threshold, then we're significant, and vice versa. So this, once we have a distribution of the size of clusters we might expect to get based on chance, we can say what the likeliness was that our cluster occurred uh, for real or based on chance. All right, and again, this is uh, basically the process that you can use when you don't have prior knowledge as to where a difference between conditions might be. Um, that kind of controls for the, the multiple comparison problem you might run into if you tried to use a simpler approach. And I've been using an example of conditions, but you can also use this to compare differences between groups. Uh, there would be slight differences. You'd want to use independent samples t-tests to quantify the effects at each time point and channel, but the same process really can be used. Uh, to compare different groups. And this was maybe an example using ERPs, but you could also do the exact same process looking at different frequency bands. Or if you add in kind of 
different frequencies as another dimension when we're looking at clusters, right? So clusters maybe have to exist at a certain frequency range and at a certain time point and a certain channel, then you can just use that same approach, but now with an extra dimension where you can now identify clusters that exist in space, time, and frequency. All right.